subscribers. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has arrived for Inside Boxing Weekly. So here are your hosts, Mike Goodpasture, John Einreinhofer, and Jeremiah Pricer on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Inside Boxing Weekly is brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation. You can go to Facebook, find out about them. They do some great work for retired boxers. I'm your host for the show, Mike Goodpaster, and we've been away for a couple weeks because, let's face it, the last show we tried to have when I wasn't here, Jeremiah Pricer screwed it up. Jeremiah, how you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm doing well. I don't know what happened there. Just couldn't hear the audio on John's end, and how was that? Yeah, and John Einreinhofer, I'm going to introduce you with this. Do you think maybe Jeremiah did it that way on purpose? No, but but if uh, we <laughs> if I don't get to talk about if I don't get to talk about Dog Bay and Magdaleno, Bob Day is going to accuse us of conspiracy. So, all right. Uh, well, there's nothing like a dog bay <laughs> and a cover up. <laughs> yeah. Well, what the hell? Uh, at least we have some interesting fights this weekend coming up. Of course, we're doing this on Saturday night. We're doing it on Saturday night, not because there was a good fight on, but because there was next to nothing on. Um, we're going to start off with Jermel Charlo versus Austin Trout. Um, Austin Trout seems to get all the big fights. He definitely doesn't duck anybody. Um, when I look at this, so what I see is Austin Trout. I mean, He's been in some wars lately, John, and I have a hard time thinking that he's going to have enough left here to hang with Charlo. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, Mike, but I'm looking at it the same way. You, you can't help it when you when you look at this fight and you see who's fighting, you know, Jermel Charlo and Austin Trout. The first thing you think of is who has fought tougher competition in boxing in 2018 over the, the course of their career than Austin Trout? And the answer would have to be nobody. Uh, you know, he's, it's going to be now both, both Charlos, uh, Lara, Canelo Alvarez, uh, you know, Cotto, Heard. Heard. I mean, you know, Jared Hurd, you know, he, he just had the tough fight with him. Uh, that was, was an action fight for him too. That, we you know, he got Cotto. stopped at he the fought end. Cotto too, didn't he? Yeah. That's like I said. Cotto, he fought, okay, you know, didn't. beat Miguel Cotto. I mean, uh, the guy has, uh, you know, the guy's fought, the guy, the guy's fought tougher opposition than everybody in boxing, you know, both Charlos, you know, Jamal Charlo and now Jamel Charlo. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, picture Austin Trout having enough left at this point to quite get by Jermel Charlo, but you know, he, he's fought well enough against uh, Jermel Charlo and, and even heard before getting stopped that even at this point, it, it's probably a fight that you can't say he doesn't have a chance. Now I'm certainly picking Jermel Charlo in the fight, but I, I would think that Jermel Charlo not having been a power puncher against the better guys that he has fought the really the question about this fight will be you know will Jermel Charlo it, it could be competitive but you would think Jermel Charlo would win but the question would be does he have any chance of stopping him he's been power punching lately uh since he changed trainers from uh, Ronnie Shields to uh, Derek James that's really the question for me if that power punch carries over against Austin Trout even though Austin Trout got stopped by uh, Jarrett heard there's no shame in that that would make me take note but I'm gonna say I don't think he can do that I think Austin Trout will probably lose a somewhat competitive but clear decision in this one yeah and when I look at it uh, I give Trout a shot in this Jeremiah but that's just because Trout's in every fight whether it's Canelo anybody he's fought he's given trouble to he's a very good fighter and really to me the question is how good is Jermel Charlo because I like Jermall, but I'm not completely sold on Jermall yet. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's I think that would be the consensus amongst most boxing fans is that Jermall has proven a bit more, uh, and I think this is sort of to John's point where you have Jermall, who's the bigger brother, looks like the, the you know the the bigger puncher. He wasn't even able to get Trout out of there, so you know we're sitting here wondering, and I think a lot of us are. You know, how does the smaller, uh, lesser puncher of the brother do? Uh, you know, I do think it is possible that Jermel could get him out of there, even though he is, 
not the puncher that his brother is. And I say that because we, we, you know, Austin Trout has been in tough competition lately, and it, it's it's always hard to tell how that would affect a guy. I mean, you know, he might come in and and look shop warm, and and you know, against a young sprightly uh, up and comer like Charlo, that might be good enough to to get the stoppage. Uh, I I am going to say that I don't think Trout is shop worn enough to get stopped here he is crafty enough you know if he chooses to box a little bit i think he can hang in there for 12 rounds but uh, i think i'm of the opinion of most people here that jermel is going to score a clear enough decision uh you know again I, it's just hard to tell it's hard to read into that sort of stuff you, you know what what does trout actually have left you know and of course we probably could have said that uh you know a little while ago but he, he's proved time and time again that he's okay and uh, you know, I think he goes 12 here. It's just tough here. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it wouldn't surprise me if Trout wins this. And the more I look at this, if I thought Trout had as much as left as he did when he fought, you know, his the brother of Charlo, Jamal, I think I might even pick Trout in this because I'm really not sold on Jamal. But I, I'm going to go with a little bit closer fight than you guys have it, I think. But I'm going to go with Charlo, but it's reluctantly. Um, next up. The main event on that card, we got Abner Mares in the second attempt to beat Leo Santa Cruz. Um, when you look at this, Jeremiah, is there anything Mares can do differently to win this fight? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose so. I mean, he'd have to stay more active than he was in the first fight. He'd have to, what I think he would have to do is he would have to fight more. Um, and box less. I mean, he'd have to find a way to get inside Leo Santa Cruz's longer arms and work to the work to the body effectively. I do think that's going to be a tough tough proposition for him because he's so used to being a boxer puncher sort. Where I mean, he's not really a puncher, but he fights in a style as if he you know he has enough power to get your respect. He, I think he's going to go. He's going to have to go right after Santa Cruz, take away Cruz's jab. And again, bad stairs. That is is what I think he has to do. Can he do it? I don't think I'm convinced. I mean, he has looked sharp. You know, he, he almost looks as if he's had some sort of rejuvenation in his career lately. But when you're fighting, you know, the best 126 pounder in the world, and I'm not saying, you know, that I think Cruz is the best 126 pounder based on skill necessarily, but based on what he's proven. Uh, I think, you know, he's rightly ranked number one. Uh, I, I just, I, I, I'm not convinced that he can get that done. Cruz has shown that when he wants to, he can box pretty effectively. A lot of people had him, you know, uh, sorry. I don't know what the hell. Sorry about that. I don't Are know what the, the hell is going on. truck stop doing the show again? I don't know what the hell is going on, man. People are racing up and down the street. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> No, but I, I think, you know, Cruz, again, a lot of us had Frampton as, a, as a, a fairly clear favorite going into the rematch against Santa Cruz. But Santa Cruz showed that he can box when he wants to. Again, he, he showed a good jab. His lateral, lateral movement was pretty good. You know, his technique was pretty sharp. I, you know, I just I, I don't think Mars is even on the skill level of a Frampton. So I just don't think he's going to get that done here. I'm going to call Santa Cruz by a pretty clear decision. Uh, but it's going to be a fun fight. I mean, Mars is going to go out there and try to get it. Yeah, my question on this whole fight, John, and how competitive it could be compared to the first one is the fact that the first one took place three years ago. In between that, 2016, he won a split decision over Cuellar, Mares did, and then he won a fairly clear technical decision over Andres Gutierrez in 2017. So my concern here at this weight, you know, 32 years old, he's a featherweight, he's only fought once a year the last couple of years, is there any way he could be sharp enough to beat Santa Cruz? Yeah, I think he's going to be very sharp. I don't want to contradict myself here, but I think he's going to be very sharp, but I think this is the last hurrah. Maris is, you know, Maris is about 5'4". He's been, in, he's been in some tough fights you know, where he got uh, blitzed by Gonzalez, and then he had a, a t- that war with Santa Cruz, which was a great fight. You know, I, I agree, as Jeremiah has pointed out on the show, um, you know, in an ideal situation, when you look at the overall featherweight division, Santa Cruz has kind of earned the number one spot, so to speak. And there's a lot of other uh, good 
fight great, you know, good, good fighters, you know, maybe could be great at the end of their career, uh, who were with Al Heyman, uh, who could match up with Santa Cruz, you know, Russell, uh, Frampton's available. Uh, you know, he, he's had some affiliations, you know, fighting in Heyman cards. Uh, those, those, those would be, uh, you know, a, a third fight with Santa Cruz would be great. You know, Frampton or a first fight between him and Russell. But with that said, the first fight with Santa Cruz and Morris, I think people are almost forgetting how good of a fight it was. It, you know, it really was a great fight. It was on ESPN. Uh, it's a shame really. We didn't get more PBC on ESPN like that because that was a great fight. I do know a few casual fans who did happen to turn into that fight and were impressed. And that's the type of thing when PBC was doing that, you would have liked to see more of, but getting back to the fight itself, I think that, you know, Mares went with uh, Robert Garcia for the Quajar fight. Uh, yeah, it was a majority decision on the, the scorecards, but that was just bizarre. I mean, uh, Mares looked great. He dominated Quajar. Now we saw Tank Davis blow out Quajar. So you got to keep that in mind, but uh, Morris looked really good in that fight, and Robert Garcia is an excellent trainer. I think that this is going to be the Abner Morris last hurrah fight, and I do disagree with Jeremiah a little bit on the strategy. I think if you you saw uh, what Robert Garcia did with Morris in the Quajar fight, he had him boxing a lot more. I don't think that he's going to fight with Santa Cruz like he did in the first fight. I think that he's going to be. He's going to come to fight, but I think he's going to be, he's only 5'4", but I think he's going to be more elusive. I think he's going to be trying to box Santa Cruz a little more. And if you saw the first fight between Santa Cruz and uh, Frampton, you saw that Frampton was able to do that effectively against uh, Santa Cruz in that fight. And I think that's what you're going to see Mares do more of this time. And I think it is going to be a close fight. I think it's probably going to go down to the wire, but I think Santa Cruz will have a little too much for him. In, in a way, Santa Cruz is one of the more underrated fighters in the world because, as Jeremiah said, and I agree with, you know, really, in terms of what he's done, he is the number one featherweight right now, which is a tough division. And, and that alone should kind of get you a little more respect in the sport when we're talking about some of the best pound for pound. And Santa Cruz doesn't really get discussed in that, that much, but he probably deserves it. He was decisive in reversing that first Frampton result, which he clearly lost, but it was close the first time. And, uh, you know, he probably deserves a little more respect like that. Uh, love to see him fight Russell after this, and let's hope that's what happens. But I think this is going to be a really good fight. I think it'll be Morris's last to ride. I think he'll look good, but I just don't think uh, there'll be anything left in the tank after this one. All right, and next up we get the fight that I know John thinks is going to be the fight of the year. We've got the return of Tyson Fury against Sefer Seferi. Uh, Seferi, though, 23-1, and 1, 21 knockouts. Um, he did hold, and I still think he may hold this, but he's the vacant World Boxing Federation Intercontinental Cruiserweight Champion. He got that by beating Laszlo Hubert, who he also, Dang. in a rematch, he beat Laszlo Hubert three months ago. Laszlo's 50 and 23 seems to be a really, really below average fighter. And I'd say when you look at Sefer Seferia or whatever the hell his name is, you know, that sounds like an STD, doesn't it? John, <laughs> we got the test back, John, and you've got Sefer Seferia. Um, <laughs> all, 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 I, I don't want to have that, and I hope I never have had it. But uh, let me just say that uh, Sefer Seferia is probably a guy that people in his own immediate family don't know. He's a professional boxer. So, yeah, you know, you know, there's there's two thing there's there's two ways to look at this fight, uh, both ways that I don't like it, and uh, I'll say the first way is this. Let's look at boxing history, and I can even go to recent boxing history, and it really annoys me when people talk about, oh, Fury needs this now, he's been off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, can't take risks, blah blah blah. Muhammad Ali came back against Jerry Quarry, the number one contender, okay? But let's go to recent boxing history. Vitaly Klitschko came back against Samuel Peter, okay? <laughs> Samuel Peter, who was one of the top heavyweights at the time, all right? Tyson Fury is coming back against Zephyr Zephyri, or uh, hopefully I'm getting that right, but I won't have to remember it anymore after this week because we'll never have to talk about it again. Um, that's, that's one way I don't like this fight. Okay. Is 
don't, don't tell me that he's got, I mean, you know, you know, it may have been ill-advised, but you know, James Jeffries came back against Jack Johnson. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we don't need Tyson. Wait a Fury second. Mike Jeffrey Tyson came reason. back against Peter McNeely though. Mike Tyson did come back against Peter McNeely. There are other examples more recently, and I'm not saying you necessarily have to come back as tough against those guys, but this idea that you have to come back at, with something like this is He could have fought Manuel okay? Char. Well, right. I mean, that, that, I mean, I'd you, take you, that. that I'd would, accept that. I mean, even 30 years ago, the guy would come back against the contender, at, at least come back against the contender. Well, you, not you know, especially. You know, uh, well, especially just, how you know, uh, especially how weak the division is, anyways. I mean, sh- hell, I think Tyson Fury could have came back and boxed Andy Ruiz's ears off. That's just my opinion, but you know, I yeah, think they're back to get Andy Ruiz. What about? I mean, you know, the the British guys. You want a British fight? I mean, he, he, you know, you have promotional things and stuff, but but in, this is we're talking in theory. I mean, it, it would be too high of a risk for Tyson Fury to come back against Dillian White. I mean, come on, you, you know, that, that's one. And two, I like to go with the Tony Ayala and um, Felix Trinidad example, because it, it is fact, you know, even though we know, especially in hindsight, that he would have gotten absolutely blown out. Tony Ayala, his first fight out of prison was offered seven figures to come, come back on the HBO against Felix Trinidad. Okay. He elected to take the slow route. Ended up picking up a loss, never became a factor again, never, never got any of those kind of paydays. I well, feel actually, comfortable saying second, that right John, now about Fury. John, did you buy the pay-per-view of his first fight back? No, I did not. I, I, I did not buy his. It was his he, first fight back on pay-per-view, it was but pay-per-view, I didn't buy it. He that. fought Tony Minifee. Okay, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. So he, but he, he ended up picking up that loss against Santos Carmona on ESPN, and so it backfired. You know, in other words, he, I thought he, he was, lost to Yori yeah. Boy Campus. Yeah, maybe Carmona was the one he surprised me and won. I, let me let me correct myself there, and then then Campus was where he picked yeah, up Campus, the loss. You might be Campus right about took that. Him to the woods yeah, yet, if I remember right, that was all right. I got him reversed. It was can It was the Carmona where he surprised me. He did get the win on ESPN, then Campus took him to the woodshed. Right? Okay, I, I got him mixed up, but it ended up back, it ended up backfiring. Um, but the point is, to me. I think I can even look, you know, you, you can always be wrong, but a year or two into the future, and I think I will be proven right on this one, so I don't mind stating it now. This is going to be a mistake for Tyson Fury, not Zephyr, but that he's not going to come back against Anthony Joshua, frankly. Now, let me just state it. Would Joshua blow him out, in my opinion, coming back? Yes, but the payday would be huge. I think it will prove to be more money than he will make in his comeback. And I think it's a miscalculation. He comes back against Joshua now. He'd get a huge payday. Uh, I would say an eight. I, I think he could generate an eight-figure payday out of that in the UK. And uh, he's going to take the slow route back. Uh, people are going to start forgetting about him. He's, he's not going to impress anybody. Or, you know, if he knocks out Zephyr, what's it going to matter? Uh, and, and, you know, he, he won't end up getting as big of a payday. You know, Wilder's still out there. You know, people want Wilder, Joshua, and, and Fury will, will, will kind of fade, and he'll probably end up picking up a loss. I mean, his, his, his performance against Klitschko, not because Klitschko wasn't uh, a borderline legend with his length of title reign, and he was the winner champ, but the fact that he was fading and the way he looked in the fight, that's got to be one of the most overrated boxing performances of all time. You know, 30 years ago and before, when you had the heavyweight champ of the world really was the man and the top man in sports, I don't think the, the type of performance Tyson Fury had landing three punches around would have been accepted as, as a title-taking performance. Uh, you know, Klitschko didn't do anything either, don't get me wrong, but, but that's got to be one of the most overrated performances of all time. So I don't, I don't think that this Tyson Fury comeback – taking the slow route is going to amount to much. And that's really uh, what I don't like about this fight, no matter how you look at it. All right, Jeremiah. All right, Jeremiah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think you may be wrong there, John. I mean, I, I think, I think the long-term goal is to get Anthony Joshua 
uh, in the ring, and I think he could cash out pretty heavily if he just – all he really needs to do is wait for the Deontay Wilder fight to to pass, and, and I think he's he's golden. I mean, and if you're going to fight, you know, what, a guy like Sefari and, and uh, you know, maybe some other guy in a weak division like this, I think you could easily move him into that position because everybody would want to see the fight. I mean, imagining, you know, and, and we'll, you know, maybe we'll talk about this later, but, you know, Joshua fights Povetkin later in the year, then they fight Wilder early next year or, you know, around July. I'm not quite sure what the weather is like. And then you get Tyson Fury, who's, I mean, Tyson Fury was born in 1988. I mean, he's, he's not old by uh, heavyweight standards. I mean, he's what, 29, 30, something like that. Uh, so I think that Tyson Fury could take it relatively easy and work himself back into a title shot with whoever wins the the Wilder Joshua fight. And you know, if it's Joshua, I think that's even bigger money for him. And I, I, I just don't think that it's, I, j- I just don't think that it's that difficult to play it safe until that time comes. Could he potentially, you know, fight a guy like, you know, a fringe contender like Derek Chisora or something? And, you know, I know they've already fought, but, you know, somebody like that and potentially be upset. Sure, it could happen. Uh, you know, it's with the way Tyson Fury, Fury treated himself, you know, after he won the title. You never know. I mean, it's, it's tough to see, uh, you know, and with his history of mental problems, it's it's tough to see, you know, ha- see how all well these guys are going to keep it together, you know, and laying off that long anyways, it's, it's likely that Tyson Fury isn't going to be 100% of what he was before. But I, you know, in this day and age, I mean, you look at a guy like Brian Jennings and Jennings has just been playing it you know, relative, relatively safe as well. Uh, you know, he, he had a, a decent fight in his last comeback, but now he's, he's fighting Joseph Barker. I mean, I think with Tyson Fury and with his character, you know, it's he it, Tyson Fury, in my opinion, is a character that he, he's a much more intriguing character than Deontay Wilder or Anthony Joshua. And I know we've been over this on the show n- a number of times. And I, I, and I know, Mike, you agree with me. <clears throat> Anthony Joshua feels manufactured to me. It, it feels like he's just not let off the chain. You know, it, he, he doesn't feel like he's being himself. Uh, he's restrained, you know, and he's just not, uh, you know, you know I, I like when guys play respectful, you know, that's, it's, it's good on them, but it, do, again, it doesn't, uh, you, you look at Tyson Fury and he, he's just good at shit talking, right? I mean, he's, he's a character. I mean, he's and in your he face. Has about a, a beautiful voice. And a beautiful voice. I mean, if and anybody, I'll tell you what there has not been a boxer that was ranked that had that pretty a voice since Pablo Baez. Since Pablo Baez, exactly. He used to sing those. What, sweet what, what about Joe? Fra- what about Joe Frazier? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, see, this is the thing. I think it's stupid when you compare Deontay Wilder to a poor man's Larry Holmes. I think it's just as stupid when you compare Joe Frazier's voice. To the beautiful voice of Tyson Fury, yeah, or Tyson even Pablo Fury can't Bias. sing. I'll, I'll, I'll give I'll give Tyson Fury that he can't well, sing, and, and but, he is a good and, character. Yeah, and maybe well, that's that, the yeah. problem. Maybe that's what led to the cocaine, because we all know rock stars, you know, like to do the coke and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Maybe people were just shoving it in his face because they liked him so much. They're like, "Hey, dude, do some lines of blow with me." And he's like, "All right, yeah. mate." You know, sing us an Aerosmith was... song while we do some blow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he was he was just up there doing karaoke, and you know somebody put a line on the table. I mean, forgive the guy, right? You, yeah. you know he likes he likes to party a bit. I mean, it's it not as if for he was... Josh Warrington. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it works for for Warrington. It works for anybody. I mean, you know, Warrington's a workings man, fellow. But it, no, Fury is a he's he's a character, right? Deontay Wilder. I mean, he's brash, but he's not well spoken. Uh, you know, his character is kind of up and down, in my opinion. You know, again, Joshua feels manufactured. It, so Fury sticks out like a sore thumb, in my opinion, because of just how well. He, I mean, you, he looks, he sounds like one of those guys who's a part of the pub culture in in Great Britain. You know, like he's hanging out with the guys on a bar on Friday night, and he's just shooting the shit with them, right? He's giving them shtick. He's, you know, and that's just who he is. And I think it works well, especially in a division that needs talent and needs, again, I'm not saying Tyson Fury is is an exceptional talent, but in, in a division like we have now, you need somebody who could potentially carry that torch 
uh, you know, in a character manner as well, not only as a fighting manner. And, and I think with the way Anthony Joshua has performed lately, and if he comes through the Deontay Wilder fight, I don't think people would, you know, write off Fury's chances all that much. But, uh, you know, in regards to his comeback fight, I, you know, I guess I better address that. I, I don't, I don't really care about it. You know, in my, in my opinion, he's just staying active. Uh, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, he probably could have found somebody else. I mean, there are tons and tons of European fringe level guys who he could have went out there and, and box their ears off and it, it all be just the same. I, I don't, it doesn't really matter much to me. I mean, I, I, he's just working his way, waiting. He's just sitting on his hands and waiting until, uh, uh, you know, his chance against the winner of Deontay Wilder and Joshua pop up and I, I can't blame the guy. Yeah. Uh, so I would say from this, John, you give Tyson Fury no chance against Joshua or Wilder. And Jeremiah, you think that there is a chance. Oh, yeah. I, I definitely think there's a chance. I mean, you look at the way Joseph Parker was able to box, uh, again, effectively, right? He, I mean, he lost, you know, I. That was pretty clear, but Fury is a better and bigger fighter than Joshua Joseph Parker is. If he can utilize ladder movement like Parker did, but longer again, u- utilizing the jab, uh, I-, I think he his chances are just fine against either one of those guys. Yeah, I don't, I don't give, I don't give Fury much of a chance at all against Joshua Wilder. I think they have too much all- offense for him. Uh, Fury went non-combatant against him way over the hill, Vladimir Klitschko, who was fought like a zombie and had the uh, passion of a zombie in that fight. Uh, that told me pretty much all I needed to know there. I, I do. I mean, I agree with Jeremiah in the sense that I think Fury's the best character in the division. I'm not saying he has no talent either or anything like that. The guy is six, nine, but the guy's been off and the guy had a positive PED test as well. We can't ignore that fact. He was also out because of that. I just think when you look at even paydays, the suspense of a Tyson Fury, <laughs> excuse me, in theory, coming back now against the Joshua would actually be a bigger payday than he's going to end up getting. I'm not saying he's not going to end up getting the shot at the man, so to speak, if that's Joshua or Wilder down the road, and it won't be a big fight. But I actually think he could generate a bigger fight now if he just came back against Joshua. And I don't think that this slow road is going to really be all that profitable for him. Yeah, well, don't, I, don't, don't you think that his best chance to beat one of them oh, is to fight beforehand instead of coming back from McDonald's drug and do stupor and trying to fight <laughs> right off the bat against Joshua? Yes, I do agree that in theory, his best chance to actually get the win would be to have tune up fights. But I just don't think that he's going to do it anyway, and I don't think the payday will be as big down the road. I'm not saying it won't be big enough, but I don't think it will be as big. Um, I just think that's the way things tend to go sometimes. I don't think he's going to be able to build that much momentum for it. I mean, it'll be a big enough fight, but I think now, again, one of the reasons I say that is because he is a character. Let's just say in theory – he was signed to fight Anthony Joshua uh, in the fall. Uh, and, and, you know, Fury was doing the build up. It, you know, it'd be kind of like an Ali against Holmes. You know, it's not that anybody should be giving Ali that much of a chance against Holmes, but because Ali, of course, was the greatest character of all time, uh, he's able to build it up. He's able to get people believing in it. He's able to get people interested in it. And it becomes a huge fight even though it ended up being a non-competitive fight. I see it that type of way. But I agree with you, Mike. If you're, if you're talking about actually going back to win uh, and become clearly the heavyweight man or the linear heavyweight champion, without a doubt, uh, at this point, yes, I would say boxing-wise, a so, couple of so fights is going to give him a chance. So you think this fight him against Joshua or Water would be as big a mismatch as Ollie and Holmes? No. No, because okay. Fury's know. younger and he's got more left. But I'm just making the comparison there. I don't think it would play out similarly. I don't think it would be that kind of a mismatch. Yeah, right. well, Good, yeah, 
I was going to say, John, it sounds like you need a glass of water, so go ahead and wet your palate. I thought maybe, I was, I I thought maybe he was over in the UK partying with Tyson Fury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Is it, is it, is it Tyson Fury supposed to be getting ready for a fight now? So if, if we were I don't that think kind that matters. Party, My guess is he's snorting some, you know, some coke off a of hooker's ass right now, but it's just a guess. Yeah, he's not going to have to change his lifestyle. He's not going to have to change his lifestyle much for Zephyr. We know that. No. Well, see, well, I did see a picture of Tyson Fury recently, and he did look like he's in pretty good shape. I mean, his arms are fairly muscular. It <laughs> looks like looks like the man has been putting in some work. But I, I think that you know, for me, if 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 while if Wilder and Joshua fight one another, that 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 clears the path in my opinion. So you will have the man, right? So if, if Wilder and Joshua fight, you will have a new champion, heavyweight champion of the world. And Fury can, you know, win back his, his former glory, right? You know, whether he wins or not, it, it doesn't matter. But in my opinion, if you take one of the guys out of the equation, right, you know, Joshua and Wilder, they fight each other, one of them's out of the way. So then it just means that, I mean, in a heavyweight division like this, I mean, if you have Joshua beat Povetkin later on this year, and, you know, so that essentially clears uh, another top five guy or, you know, five-ish guy talent I, out of the way, right? So so Parker's been beaten, uh, you know, Pavetkin will have been beaten. I mean, who can you really look forward to? Maybe and that's what hard. I'm saying. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, the, the Max Schmeling-ish uh, German heavyweight champion of the world. No, if you get... If you get Povetkin out of the way, you get Wilder or Joshua out of the way, Fury is clearly going to be, you know, most talked about and, you know, to fight whoever the, the, the winner that is. But maybe it might not even matter. Maybe Povetkin will upset Joshua and Brazil beat Wilder and then <laughs> then we can have that. You never know. Yeah. I think this, John, in the end, if Joshua was to beat Wilder early to mid next year, and Fury's still undefeated. I think the fight is bigger then than it is now for Fury. I think that you're right, though. If Wilder was to beat Joshua or somebody beats Joshua in the meantime, then he missed out on a huge payday. Yeah, we never know how these things are going to play out. I mean, you're right. You would have to think. You're right. I mean, you could argue that even taking my theory that were Joshua to beat Wilder and then Fury picks up a couple wins that – you know, yeah, Fury and Joshua would be. I mean, some, Joshua. Although, although Joshua was gonna, although Joshua was gonna look. But again, though, if Joshua has taken out Wilder there, uh, I don't think people are gonna be giving Fury much of a chance against Joshua if he's swatting away guys like Zephyr. All right, remember uh, this: we're talking about the UK. No offense to the listeners of the UK, but these are the same people that if you threw Frank Bruno against Anthony Joshua right now, forty thousand of them would show up cheering for Frank. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it would you would have it, it could very well be a comparable payday, no argument there. But but you got a good point though. If Wilder, although I suppose if Wilder knocks out Joshua, which I would think would happen, that Fury could be the redemption of British glory. <laughs> going up against yeah, Wilder. but I, I still don't think see Wilder there you go, John. Fight because I don't think anybody in this country would care either way. Well, if he knocks out Joshua, a lot of people care. I don't, yeah, boxing fans. The the thing is this. If Joshua and Wilder fight, does anything outside of boxing fans watch the fight? You know, because even if Wilder knocks out Joshua, if nobody in this country or most of the people in this country who are sports fans can't tell you right now who the heavyweight champion of the world is, those same people probably don't know who Anthony Joshua was. So I just don't see where there's going to be a big buzz from this fight. And all that comes back to the fact that you've got Wilder and Joshua, who, as you said, Joshua seems like he is restrained from being himself. And to me, Wilder, I think, has a little Larry Holmes in him where he goes over the top trying to get people to pay attention to him. No, I I agree, yeah. but if I think if Wilder beats Joshua, you a lot of people will know who Wilder is because he will be the first real heavyweight champion in a long damn time. I mean, and, and there's still a mystique about it. I mean, being the heavyweight of the champion, right? I mean, so, some of the, the, you know, the terms we use and whatnot, you, you hear all across other sports, like, oh, they're a great one-two punch and, and et cetera, et cetera, right? I think if Wilder wins, you will know who he is. He will get promotional deals. Uh, 
he will get commercials, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Vladimir Klitschko. Yeah, I think Wilder Joshua will be big. Vladimir Klitschko was the undisputed heavyweight champion for a long time. Yeah, right. But, yeah, and he was huge in, in uh, I mean, in Europe, he was massive. Yeah. Germany, he was very big in Germany. He, he became the German big big thing, big thing to go in Germany. In yeah, TV outside of Max Schmeling and, and Manuel Char. All right, let's go ahead and get to <laughs> Um, the WBO World Welterweight title. We've got Terrence Crawford challenging Jeff Horn. Um, I already know that John's going to say mean things about my guy, Jeff Horn. So I'm going to start with <laughs> yeah. Jeremiah. So say that. Jeremiah, <laughs> I may not even go to you during this part of the show, John. So you better be nice. All we right. Don't hear um, it. Jeremiah, any shot for Jeff Horn here? Any shot? Well, yeah, I've, I've always got to give somebody a shot anymore. I mean, I don't, I don't want to, you know, again, I, I think Crawford's going to win and win handily, but, you know, giving a guy no shot any, you know, as, as long as I've been around boxing, I don't want to say no so shot. are you giving you know, Sepher, Sepher Ree a shot? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm giving him a, some shot. I mean, I, I'm not... I, I, I'm not sure I can give guys like a zero percent chance anymore. You never know. I mean, when we, you know, when we're seeing guys like, uh, you know, when we're seeing these upsets and we're acting so damn confident, like we saw in Selby and Warrington and you know Truix and DeGale and others. Yeah, I, I, I'm pumping the brakes now. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit more moderate in my approach. But yeah, I mean, you never know. I mean, as rough as Horn is, you, you know, and Croc. I suppose there's a. Um, I suppose there's a way where, you know, Crawford starts slow trying to feel horn out and horn takes like three of the first four rounds. And then, you know, there's a cut opened up and then they stop it. Horn (laughs) horn wins a decision or something. Who knows now? But I think Crawford is clearly the better fighter here. I think he's going to outbox horn. Uh, I don't think he's going to have much trouble with horn style. I mean, horn is, he's, he's not a bad fighter. I mean, a lot of people forget that he has an Olympic background, you know, he can box a little bit when he wants to, he's awkward in the way he approaches the guys and it, it throws people off. I mean, that's part of what makes him him and makes him unique and ineffective. I mean, he pulls his head back every once in a while to counter, you know, he comes at you with odd angles and at odd times, you know, he's a, rough, big, strong guy, you know, there's a lot to like there. And, you know, we've had him on the show and he's a nice guy, you know, he's a dad, his dad's a nice guy, but you look at Terrence Crawford and, you know, some people are like, Oh, well, how, how well is he going to adapt to the weight? I think he's going to be just fine. I mean, he was pretty tall for 135, 140. Uh, I, I think he's going to be just just fine. I mean, his boxing ability is, is you know, up there with the very best in the world. Uh, you know, I think he's going to probably use a southpaw stance, try and confuse Horn a little bit. And, it, you know, Horn does have an amateur background. I'm not quite sure if, you know, he'll be able to adjust quickly or not. But Horn is just too good. I mean, sorry, Crawford is just too no, good. No, you said it. Everybody yeah, heard that- it. I'm going to make yeah, a little man. cut of that, and I'm just going to put it to start the next show. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah we'll, just, we'll, just, well, you'll have Thomas Triber introduce us, and then you'll have that cut. Horn is just too good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just, Especially just play Horn. <laughs> yeah, he loses badly. We'll, just play. We, can start, we, can, we can do our own hip-hop single, and we'll start out with just keep playing Jeremiah's cut. Yeah, saying, just play it on a loop. Yeah. Horn's too good. If Horn, Horn Horn's wins, too good. If Horn wins, then John will never hear that cut ever again. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, what, but what, no, yeah, forget that. No, uh, yeah, I, I, th- I think Crawford's probably going to stop him in, in uh, you know, the mid to late rounds. I do think Horn is a tough guy, you know, is his strength and maybe his awkwardness will carry him through, uh, you know, some of the fight. But, but Crawford, in my opinion, this is, this is his platform. Bob Arum is laying out the red carpet for him, and I think we're going to see an impressive performance. Yeah, uh, the fight I compare this to, John, is, I don't know if you remember this or not, but in 1985, Michael Spinks' last title defense was against a guy on, I think it was June 6th of 1985, he fought Diamond Jim McDonald. Do you remember that fight? Yeah, McDonald was a former U.S. Marine. Yeah, and remember it was D-Day Dynamite. I think Carlos De Leon actually got upset by Alfonso Rotliff on the undercard there. But to me, this fight looks a lot like that. And I think it's a fight where where Horn will try to impose his will, and he may land a few punches. 
He'll fight his butt off in about the seventh or eighth round at best. They stop the fight on cuts. I, don't, I, I think I got to start out, Mike, with the way you ask the question, which I think is what you got to ask about a lot of fights, which is um, do I give Horn a shot? And I think what, you know, the way we have to define that is, of course, if we're going to ever ask that question, do we give a guy a shot? Do you well, have a legitimate? I know shot? what Jer- I know what I know what yeah. right. I know what Jeremiah means, but the Not point is, let's face punch. it. We would ne- right. We would never ask that question because, of course, anything can happen at any time. But we wouldn't ask the question then because there would never be an answer other other than, right? Of course, he has a shot. Everybody's got a shot. So in the way it's meant, no, he doesn't. I, I, and some sometimes when a guy's a big underdog, I think they do have a shot in that sense. I don't think Horn does. Uh, I, I don't think Horn has a shot. You know, Horn's got a good story behind him uh, because he got the official decision uh, against Pacquiao. He's a legitimate top ten welterweight in that sense. I do agree that he's a strong guy for the weight, but that's about the best I can go for him. Uh, when when I see him against better opposition, I don't like the looks of his punching power. I didn't even like the looks of his punching power against Gary Corcoran. You know, he, he didn't do any severe damage to Manny Pacquiao. Pacquiao is over the hill. He had Horn out on his feet in the ninth round. Horn showed a lot of – it looked like the fight was going to be over now. Did Horn show a lot of heart and uh, toughness coming back and hanging in there? Yes, he did, but a lot of heart and toughness is, is a different thing from the skill and the ability and the, and the defense and the, you know, the world-class ability to hang in there with a guy like Terrence Crawford – I agree with you that, you know, it could end up on cuts, but I think that Crawford's just going to be em- embarrassing Jeff Horn, frankly, and, and giving him a beating. Uh, I think people, uh, you know, they, they make these wrong analyses with the weight all the time in modern boxing with too many weight classes. In other words, uh, you know, Terrence Crawford's already been fighting guys over the 135-pound limit at 140 pounds now. Not at a full four, 147, but... Who hasn't in this modern era where, let's just say, the last 20 years where there's too many weight classes where fighters are, are camping, uh, spending time in, uh, too many belts, who hasn't been able to make the jump up from 140 to 147 pounds? Let's, let's look at We have Timothy Bradley, Manny Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather, uh, you know, Amir Khan, uh, you know, I, I could sit here literally. Devon all Alexander, day. Marcos Maidana. Yeah, Devon Alexander. I mean, I could sit Marcos Maidana. Yeah. Adrian uh, Broner you know. didn't. Yeah. Well, well you know, well, even Broner knocked down but Sean Porter. He beat Malinaji. in the fight. Yeah, and he beat Malinaji. I mean, wow. and Malinaji himself, he picked up an alphabet belt at 147 from 140. In other words, this is a modern thing. Now, Mike, you'll you go, you'll remember this. You know, like I did in Jeremiah. Oh, we're we're going to talk about old shit now. Go ahead. Oh, well, one little reference to the old shit, because I think this is what people kind of miss, is up until circa 1982-ish, you had the alphabet organizations putting out some of these junior classes, but the fan base and the fighters themselves didn't really care about those in general. In other words, those were like a lesser thing for lesser fighters. So while they quote-unquote existed, they weren't, they weren't cared about. I mean, it, it was like a lesser thing. So it wasn't until you got later on into the 80s and then into now, the you, 90s. You, you the know, 2000s. the first fight that was a junior title fight that I think really got everybody's attention was when Roberto Duran fought Davey Moore in 83 for the junior middleweight title. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you were getting into, I, I think it was, but you it's know, because it you was know Sugar, Sugar Ray. Ray. <laughs> what is in Sugar Ray Leonard tried to get cute. He fought Kalule, but yeah, but remember, he fought Kalule. He fought Kalule as the equivalent of a, a tune-up fight, staying busy. You know that that's the key you got to understand if you know the boxing history. In other words, it wasn't that anybody cared about that fight. It was just like, oh, you know, you know, Ray's gonna Ray's gonna take yeah. a fight to keep hey, busy. And you got to finish this look. off because on that card was what. Hearns and ba- Pablo Baez. There you go. Right? There's so, two Pablo Baez. And that Baez. shows oh, you. Oh, damn. And and that, and that, and, but that's the key, is that it was Leonard Kalula. And, Mike, that is the perfect example of my point. I'm glad you pointed that yeah, out. Yeah, but Leonard Kalula was, was a Baez. good fight. And Ayub Kalula was, was a good fighter. 
Yeah, but he wasn't that good. I mean, he was you know, good. He was a, he wasn't he wasn't a bad fighter. I'll say that. You know, he wasn't a bad fighter. He was a competent fighter. But and Leonard wasn't taking it that seriously. You know, he had a couple rounds of maybe a little more quote unquote difficulty than would have been expected. But but I think it illustrates it perfectly. Right? It was Leonard Kalule hurts by his unsafe card. I mean, the point was like that was like a tune up. That was like a tune up fight card because you know the general boxing media back then knew what the alphabets were and, and why i turned that into horn crawford is because you know this is not this is just not that tough of a fight for for terrence crawford and and aram and top rank are using the wbo belt and all that kind of smoke screen stuff I mean, and i just don't think it's that tough of a fight i think what'll get jeff horn probably in some trouble is with the mythical pound for pound thing I think Terrence Crawford is probably a prideful of enough of a guy himself that he's the gas himself, maybe even more than his own promoters of, Hey, you know, I've got Errol Spence out there. There's a lot of good welterweights out there. You know, Lomachenko just came off a, uh, an exciting, uh, impressive knockout. I've got to, you know, make my stake in this kind of chaotic world of modern boxing where you don't have, regular champions really anymore and we're just kind of ranking guys on polling we really have devolved to that that i i think why that ties into this fight is that i think it'll be bad news for jeff horn in the sense that terence crawford just knows i got to make some kind of because this fight itself is that important but be just because i've got competition with other fighters for you know getting publicity name recognition i just think it all adds up to i just think this is basically uh, going to turn out to be a match i just don't think Skill wise, Jeff Horn, he just hasn't shown me much, frankly. Uh, I like his story. Well, he shows some toughness. This. He's strong for the win, but he's not skill. I don't think we've seen a Terrence Crawford fight that wasn't a mismatch skill wise. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I, I almost look at this in a way. Yeah, I, I do look at it, even though John Molina fought as a lightweight and he'd been stopped before, like in a, in a brawl with Matisse. I, I just, you know. And, and he'd been stopped other times, but I, I just, it's almost to me like this is like a Terrence Crawford when he fought Molina, you know, like Molina, you know, I mean, I think Molina is a, a bigger puncher than Jeff Horn is frankly. And, you know, you know, Molina just ended up, you know, it, it ended up being a mismatch. He ended up getting blasted out of there when Crawford decided to turn it up. And I kind of, even though Horn's stronger, I, I see it something like that because I think Molina, frankly, is a, a better puncher than Jeff I Horn think, is. I, I think that's the problem. Um, I think Jeff Horn, the way he fights, could make Crawford uncomfortable. But the problem is, if you don't have the threat of being able to hurt him with a big punch, I mean, Crawford's just going to butcher him. I mean, I hate to say that. Cause yeah. I lo- I- I'm as big a Jeff Horn fan as you'll find. I love the underdog, kind of like an Australian Rocky story. But <laughs> when I look at it, that's the problem. Because I think physically he probably is stronger than Crawford. He can push him back. He can apply pressure on him. He can hit him, but he can't hurt him. So in the end, all that pressure and the style that may give Crawford trouble doesn't matter if you can't hurt him. I agree well, with you, that. Well, yeah, you got you got to be able to find Crawford, and defensively, he's good. I mean, it's it's not as if Crawford cannot be hit. I mean. Uh, uh, you know, it's just one reference, and I don't want to h- put too much weight on this, but Crawford was stunned by Yorkios Gamboa, who, you know, for all intents and purposes, was was really, you know, should have been a 126-pounder. You know, so it's, it's not as if I'm not accusing Crawford of having no chin or any of that stuff. What I'm saying is, you, you know, there there is some potential there. You know, I, I don't think Horn is a bad puncher. But yeah, it's it's you know it, he's got to find Crawford, who's excellent defensively, and Crawford is very consistent with his jab. That's one thing that uh, separates him from so many other people is he's constantly jabbing, whether it's from the orthodox stance, whether it's from the southpaw stance, and and that's what makes him even more difficult is is he can switch, you know. So if he feels as if he's not giving you enough trouble position he'll he'll switch positions and a lot of times that's why he fights from the southpaw position because it, it just makes things easier for him um and i but i wanted to bring up one thing sorry i wanted to bring up one thing uh i, I wanted to ask about the the welterweight division as a whole because we're all looking forward to you know crawford and spence 
And I often hear that 147 is a damn good division, but I'm looking through it. Is it really that good of a division? I mean, does it really seem as if we're really just waiting on Crawford and Spence? You know, because you, you look at Horn again, he's he's probably going to be stopped, you know, soon. Pacquiao's old. You know, Lucas Matisse, his opponent is is way past it. You know, Garcia and Porter, you know, they don't really look like – much of a threat to Errol Spence, you know, well, I don't want to say they, they don't look, they wouldn't be favored to beat him. That's for sure. Especially Danny Garcia, Porter would probably give him more problems because of his, his physicality and style. But, you know, Jesse Vargas and, you know, Peterson and, you know, I just don't really see the division as all that strong anymore. Yeah. I, I don't think it is either. When you look at it, you got a bunch of older guys like Pacquiao and Bradley, Bradley retired anyways, but Kel Brook, I mean, well, yeah, well, Brooks. Helamir yeah. Khan might be the most dangerous guy out of all of those. Yeah, well, and, and Brook moved. Uh, Brook moved up, so you know there's not much of a chance that he's going to be fighting there. I, I think even if he fights, he probably him and Con, uh, Brook and Khan would probably fight at 154 if they were going to make that fight happen. But yeah, I'm just looking at the influx of talent, and you know you have Jamal James, but you know does he really look like he's going to stack up against the best of the best? Ugas, no, not really. Uh, you know. Kovialowskis looks good. That's a fighter that I really like, but you, you know, I just don't see a whole lot there. Well, I think the division's still tough, but I think Jeremiah makes a good point. I would just maybe reframe it as this: I think that division's still tough. You, you mentioned like Ugas, Kovialowskis, James; those guys are are uh, good. You still got Garcia and Porter, but I think Jeremiah makes a good point that I think what's maybe changed is with Keith Thurman on the shelf that. It's, it's becoming more of a clear one-two of Crawford and Spence that you can't envision, even though the division is good, you can't envision any of those other guys stepping up and competing with Crawford and Spence. Some people could envision Thurman doing that, but Thurman's out, so that kind of leaves it down to a, a two-man showdown, and I think that that's what everybody's going to want to you know, start pointing towards now. Would, would top rank ever think of putting Terrence Crawford in with a PBC guy like Errol Spence. I mean, I don't think I'm being biased that I, I think I could picture Al Heyman maybe doing that under the right circumstance, but, but just with top ranks MO, I know we just had Lomachenko, Linares, but I thought that when you look at the odds and correctly that, that Aaron top rank just thought that they were so confident Lomachenko was going to win that fight that, they were willing to take that, but that's not the case with Spence and Crawford. So top rank hasn't made that type of fight. Uh, I don't know. We have to try to think of examples. I can't think of one off the top of my head for a while. So, you know, in other words, a crossover where their guy might lose. Um, so that, that's, what's a shame. And that gets to all the problems we have in boxing. Yeah. But I don't think the welterweight division is that good either. I don't think there's too many divisions in boxing that are strong one through 10. And when you look at it, as you said, the killer there is Keith Thurman, who just seems like he's done. Yeah, yeah, like he got married. What, where did, his wife is from, what, Nepal or something like that? It's like he went to the mountains, found, a, you know, I don't know, maybe he's a Buddhist now, and he's, he's just not into it. He's into peace and love or whatever the hell. I don't, I don't know what he's doing, man. I like Keith. I mean, he's a well-rounded fighter, and he was one of those people who, who made the division more intriguing because it's like, hey, Errol Spence and, and Thurman, they're the number one and two guys on that side of the aisle. Let them have at it, you know, and then Crawford will, you know, he'll, he'll beat Jeff Horn and maybe get, you know, a few defenses out of the way. And then hopefully, ideally, we, we could get, you know, a, a, a real champion at 147. But it just looks like, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at some of these guys and I'm, I, I mean, yeah, Sean Porter, you know, if he, you know, the, the winner of Garcia Porter, that is going to be. Uh, a slightly interesting defense for Errol Spence, you know, but then you also have it split on the other side of the aisle where, you know, who's Terrence Crawford going to fight? Well, Kovialowskis is under top ranks banner. Um, I think uh, Alexander Best Putin, who looks pretty good, he's under the banner, but I'm not quite sure he's ready yet. I mean, it, it just, you, you look at this stuff and you shake your head at it. It's like, why? We just want the best fight and the best, but really the division is just, it's just not that good right now. Yeah, and if you look at it, the two guys we're talking as being the dominant guys we want to see fight each other. Errol Spence beat Kelbrook. He's beaten a few other decent guys. Terrence Crawford hadn't even fought at welterweight yet. 
So I think when you're talking about a division where you have two guys that are the clear one and two, and they haven't really beat anybody yet, I think it's hard to say the division's that good. I don't think you got to compare it to other divisions. I still think I, I still think it I don't, is top to bottom. Because either a division's good or bad, we're not comparing it to other divisions. It's just the fact that when you look at it, I mean, come on, you, you've got Errol Spence hardly even fights. I mean, since 2016, he fought Kell Brook, Lamont Peterson, and now he's fighting Carlos Ocampo. So I mean, I don't know why he's fighting Carlos Ocampo. I mean, there's a lot of guys he could have fought other than that. And then with Terrence Crawford, hasn't even had a welterweight fight yet. And those are the two best guys. I think that's the problem with boxing. I mean, I think you got that all around. I mean, you know, I, I don't like to go on to the 17 division analysis, but if you are, okay, Lomachenko just picked up his first lightweight win. And, you know, understandably, in, including myself, you're going to look at him as the top guy in the division. Uh, it's just it's just the way boxing, there's not enough legit top 10, top 5, level guys that fight off against each other enough and well, there's, uh, it, there's it just leads... not that many top 10 guys anymore i mean most of these divisions when you look at it there's not 10 guys that should be ranked in top top 10 heavyweights should dominic brazil be a top 10 heavyweight in any era well, well that's it... probably the seven, 17 divisions stuff but i think walter wade's better like that that's why i do think it's one of the better divisions because when you got guys like ugas and kavi Alaskis, even though they might not be household names, but James, guys like James, when they're like kind of on the fringe of your division, those guys are good fighters. Other divisions, I agree with you, Mike, like heavyweight is an example where you don't have that, and there's other divisions you don't have that either, When you, especially if you're going to rank 17 divisions. Yeah, well, and like you said, John, this is to the point, and I don't know how many times we have to make this to our listeners but if we didn't have 17 damn divisions, this wouldn't be such an issue. If you had, se- if you had, you know, let's let's nine classes, you know, with cruiserweight, eight divisions, whatever. You, okay, look at look at 140. The guys at 140, most of them would be at 147, right? So you'd have Regis Progre at one, you know, right. Victor pa- Victor Postal, Relic. I mean, you know, these are these aren't you know excellent. Fi- Josh Taylor, the the damn good looking uh, Scottish prospect. You know, it, it it's not we're not lighting things up with these sort of names. I mean, overall, I think you guys would agree that boxing is just not as strong as it used to be. And part of that is because the Americans are not putting out the we're not churning out the talent that we that we used to. Our amateur system is is much worse than it used to be. There's not the same emphasis on the sport that there used to be, but it could be supplemented at least to a degree, if we had fewer divisions. You know, again, Taylor, Progray, Postal, those would all be healthy additions to 147, but this is what we got to deal with. No, that's a good point. Like, that, that's where we can go back to 35. And that's why I think there is a difference where we've lost it, and the talent today would be enough. I think you make a good example, Jeremiah. People can't imagine this today, but 35 years ago would have been the case. Errol Spence wouldn't be fighting... Carlos Ocampo 35 years ago, he might be fighting Regis Pro Gray on ABC at 4.30 in the afternoon in this defense. That's not an exaggeration whatsoever. That's just reality. I mean, that's, that's where boxing has lost it. Uh, you know, you don't sit through Spence Ocampo. You know, you might not even, again, you wouldn't even have a WBO and all these divisions. You wouldn't even be sitting through Crawford Horn, you know, uh, you know, Crawford might be, uh, you know, you know, taking on, uh, you know, you're Sean Porter on on this Saturday afternoon today. Uh, it's just it's just where you've got all these kinds I'd of problems. I'd rather see Crawford that, Horn than Crawford you know, and Sean Porter. I think that you know Sean Porter is going to be there for twelve rounds, and I don't think Jeff Horn is going to be. I don't know what that's got. I just I've seen Sean Porter enough. I know what I get with Sean Porter, and I think that you guys just don't like white guys that much because you're always ripping on Jeff Horn. That's John, not me. No, it's you. Too. I just call. I just call. I just call it like I. I just call it, call it like I see it. Yeah, There's, but I mean, Sean you know, Porter part... is going to be in the fight for twelve rounds. He's going to lose by a few points. He's going to complain that he got beat. I'd better see some blood and some guts. Yeah, we'll see that this way. Okay, can, can we get? Well, in in an ideal boxing world, we would get Jeff Horn versus Sean Porter. I mean, my yeah, why? That'd be, why? That'd be a good fight. Why not have that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you know what I mean? I mean, they're both guys who can box a little bit. You know, they like to come forward and have at it. I mean, 
look, guys, I mean, this this is what we've got to deal with because of all the the you know the fractured nature of of the sport. You you can't even think about that sort of stuff. There's no way that you know Jeff Horn and Sean Porter they're just not going to get together. It's not going to happen. So you know we have to uh, you know try to read into the political side of things and be like oh well this guy can't fight this guy this guy can fight this guy et cetera et cetera. Jeff Horn versus Sean Porter would be damn entertaining. And I would love to see something like that, but again, we're not going to get it, and it's unfortunate. Or even, or even again, and we talk about guys, all, all kinds of different racial, ethnic makeups. I mean, Josh Taylor looks good. You know, what if what if Josh Taylor was? I mean, again, you would get this thirty five years ago. What if Josh Taylor was trying to? He, he was going to make his move into the welterweight top ten. He's going to take on Sean Porter. I mean, you would be you would be getting fights like that. You know, on, on Saturday afternoon. And, and, you know, it's just top 10 type guys are, are the best prospects trying to bust into the top 10 fight and legit at the top 10, not caring about 17 divisions, just caring about, you know, eight to nine divisions and yeah, not all I'll these belts. You, and, John, and I, don't the think, I don't think the biggest problem here is the 17 divisions. I still think the biggest problem is the lack of amateur boxing. If you look at it, boxing went off free over the air TV in the late 80s. Olympic boxing pretty much died out in the late 80s. The Golden Gloves, I mean, the crowds of 20,000 died out in the late 80s. So I, I think that a lot of this is just a big conglomeration of a bunch of crap happening that's bad all at the same time. And losing the amateur boxing, you lose watching the guys come up through the ranks. Uh, I don't think with the style of amateur boxing is what we see now professionally, which is a defensive style for most guys where you're just trying to touch somebody the most. Yeah, look at look at the. Sorry, just I just want to interrupt real quick. But yeah, look at the Cubans. I'm one of the professional ranks with with this this touch and go style where they're you know they're trying to land one clean power shot and then they move around. I mean it's it hasn't proven that successful in the professional ranks. The, a lot of these guys are doing well, but the style at the very top generally falters. Yeah, I think, but I think it's definitely true. That's been one of the big factors that's hurt. That then I get you would get into the question, and obviously there's a lot of factors, but one of the factors would at least be you would get back to the 17 divisions and too many belts, which is there's less amateur box boxers because boxing became less popular. Now that's not the only reason boxing became less popular and less people are doing it, but that's one of the reasons. Well, uh, and I just think that it's never going to get back to the, that way for amateurs. Hell, they're talking about getting rid of Olympic boxing now. And I think when you look at it, like growing up in 1976, I remember sitting on my couch watching Sugar Ray Leonard, Michael Spanks, Leon Spanks. Before these guys turned pro, you know, they were my heroes when I was little. You don't get that. Yeah, anymore. look at the look at the difference. Look at the difference in how good the amateur fights were back then compared to what they became. I mean, just all you got to do is pull up some of these fights on YouTube if you're younger. There was younger. no headgear watch, in 1976. <laughs> no, no headgear. They were going to knock people out. I mean, yeah. watch, you know, watch those Olympic finals with, you know, Michael Spinks, Leon Spinks, and George Foreman. Yes. You know, Sugar Ray Leonard, Joe Frazier. I mean, Stevens and it, John Tate, Dwayne Bobbick. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean it was Stevenson against Bobbick and Tate and, yeah, they, they were like getting three round professional fights. Yeah, they, they, they and, and they they picked up the pace because they were going to knock people out. It was only three rounds, and that's why people used to love to watch amateur boxing. But you know that's gone. Um, you know, yeah, it's going to be hard to you know you're not going to get things back the way they were. But you know, like like I agree 100 percent with Jeremiah and bring up. I think everybody should bring it up. You know, the UFC example, they went, what's the first thing they did? They went to eight divisions, one champ a division, basically. You know, Dana White came from a boxing yeah, yeah, background. Yeah, but this he is the thing, had... Jeremiah, or John, the UFC is getting smaller and smaller ratings, and they don't have any stars because you have no amateurs. Put it like this, the NFL is huge because you know who every NFL player is by the time they get to the NFL. The NBA is huge. Same thing. I mean, it, it, you you got to build these guys up. you got to give them a foundation so people can see them, because I remember, like, 1984, every athlete on the American team, they did an up-close-and-personal, whether it was a boxer or not, and you got a five- or six-minute story of their life. You, you don't have that anymore. Well, yeah, the 84, the 84 Olympians all – 
turn pro on network TV in prime time. Yeah, a so. night of gold. You can go on my YouTube channel and watch it. Yep. Check it out. Yep. Rate, comment, subscribe. No, but you know what you also <laughs> get? <laughs> you know, you know, but it, so we're, we are kind of speaking from an American perspective, though, because they, they are getting more of that in Europe. In Europe. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the British government, um, you know, the Irish government, they have invested much more money into their amateur boxing programs. And a lot of these guys are coming out. Uh, you know, being, you know, borderline famous before they ever make it. That's part of it. Why Anthony Joshua was able to, you know, move through the ranks so quickly and do what he's done. And even guys like Joe Joyce and Daniel Dubois. Exactly. Look at him. You know, Katie Taylor, Josh, you know, all these guys. Right. right. So they do do it that way there, which is the way to do it. But for some reason, it just kind of disappeared here. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. I think, well, I said, the defensive style of the amateur boxing, I think that that was the final nail in the coffin, was that the amateur fights, when they went to that, just you know, counting the punches for the scoring, that's really when it disappeared from American people. You know where I think it disappeared was 1992. 1992, yeah, I mean, up, up until 92, every time an American was fighting, you would see it live. In 1992, if you remember, NBC came out with that triple cast crap where you had to subscribe to see each individual sport. And the boxing was limited to basically a couple fights here and there. And then they would show the gold medal fights if it had an American in it. So with the triple cap, yeah, was... if you paid for it, you got to see it. If you didn't, you didn't. And that's kind of when it died out, because I think they did kind of the same thing in 96. And then they started putting like all the boxing on CNBC, where nobody knows where the hell that is. So I think that was the biggest problem. Is they took right, but that was that was around when TV. they started counting the, that was around when they started counting the punches though. Yeah, but I think those two things kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah they do. They go hand in hand. Yeah, because, it's certainly multifaceted. I mean, Olympic boxing wise, I don't even remember seeing David Reed win his title live. He may have, but I don't even think I knew it was going on because there was no build up to it because they just showed his gold medal match unless you had one of the cable channels, and I lived in the middle of Indiana where we didn't have cable until the mid-90s. Didn't have TVs until the 70s, but, yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> Are you trying to be cute, Jeremiah? <laughs> no, not at all. Mike, 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 was, Mike was really damaged when they took the fights off the radio in the, in the 70s. <laughs> You're older than me, John. <laughs> You're over to me. Yeah, but yeah, yeah but Jeremiah did a good setup there. I hate though, to so. tell you this, John, but I've been damaged a lot longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but they right, good. Yeah, I was just gonna say, okay, real quick, I you know, so I guess we'll wrap this up. But the amateur system has gone back to the you know, taking off the headgear for the open right. class. So that is a positive but the reason we might not get Olympic boxing is is not because of the popularity of the sport. It's because you have a guy who's uh, I, I forget what his background is, but he's a Kazakh and he was uh, what used to run heroin drug money or something. That is not going to help the sport at all. No, I mean he needs to become a congressman in the United States. Exactly. He he needs a better profession with <laughs> with better benefits. Be yeah. a politician. Yeah, he needs to be a politician if he's going to run drugs. That's unacceptable in boxing. Uh, all right, guys, we got anything else? All right, I'll take that as a no. Kind of, what? Yeah, kind of slow, kind of slow otherwise. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I thought it was fun, though, because I'll tell you, we did this every week, and I was getting kind of bored, but I had a good time tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good, nice. Yeah, I mean, I always have fun with John, but Jeremiah usually bores me because he just he doesn't want to get in a confrontation at all. But, no, I'm yeah. very, very mild-mannered. But I did want to say that, you know, in terms of heavyweight boxing, because that has been kind of a topic of discussion for tonight, it doesn't look like it's that bad. I don't really care for the division. It's not stacked by any means, but there's some good matchmaking. And, uh, you know, you may have – Joshua Povetkin in the fall. You may have Wilder Brazil. You may have Bryant Jennings versus Joseph Parker. And then I think you you might get um, 
Uh, Kubrat Pulev versus Dillian White. Those are good matches. It's good for the division. Again, this this isn't a stacked division. You know, these aren't great fights, but it's good matchmaking, and it's something to look forward to. All right, and then of course, hopefully, we get Tyson Fury and Manuel Char. Um, all right, that might be next. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead. And they can talk about Tyson Fury being a two-time heavyweight champion. Yeah, and he would have be Germany's only heavyweight champion since Max Schmeling. Right. So there yeah, that's what we got to look forward to. And mm. as a German, I can tell you, Manuel Char makes me very proud. All right, guys. Remember, you can hear all of our shows on iHeart, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts. You'll find the Grueling Truth. Um, also, if you guys are interested in writing about boxing or even doing a boxing podcast. You can hit us up at Grueling Truth on Twitter, or you can email us at thegruelingtruth at gmail.com. So if you're interested in being a writer for any sport, just hit us up. If you're going to be a boxing writer, you'll have to dare, deal with Jeremiah because he's in charge of that, and he's a real pain in the ass sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> All right, guys, we will be back next Saturday night live after Horn Crawford, right, guys? Should be able to do that, yeah. Let's do it. So we'll be live next week. Make sure you check us out. Um, For all of our sports sports podcasts, go to thegruelingtruth.net. So for John Einreinhofer, Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.